Here we so, go. So let's get started. Um, so first of all, I really appreciate you um, joining me to talk. Uh, I know that things have been controversial and possibly, probably stressful for you over on your end. And yeah, and I just appreciate your willingness to like have a public open conversation about some of the, the issues that are currently going on on the left in society in general, on social media, so on and so forth? Well, I think it's really important uh, in this uh, in this moment called Shirley that we get people's relative levels of danger in perspective. It's like, yeah, I experience a certain level of risk by doing this. But the reality is that I'm, you know, I'm a recently white man, but I, I'm a white man nevertheless. And I have for now a job with a contract and a union and things like that. Um, you know, I'm not going to get a pile of rape threats for talking to you because uh, that's, that's not the way that people like me are to be intimidated. So I think it's really important that People who have like a lower consequence uh, burden, uh, like myself, do stand up. I think it's really unreasonable the discourse among woke or progressive men who recognize their flaws in the current discourse, but it's like, why are you getting involved in saying this? You're not a woman. And I think that that's really unfortunate, the, the, the shirking of risk. It's an interesting element in how we've redefined masculinity in the post-Vietnam War era uh, that, that we can get a Donald Trump, that we can get a chicken hawk who is proud of shirking risk rather than somebody who sees the embrace of risk, however problematic it is, as part of the burden of masculinity and the privilege that we enjoy as such. So, yeah. All right. It's scary, but I'm glad to be here and it will be way more scary for someone else. Yeah, yeah, I think I think those are really good points, um, and we can get into to some of the stuff that you've brought up um, a little bit later in more depth. Um, I think you're right that like a lot of people, uh, men in particular, are sort of in self protection mode um, when in fact they need to be doing the opposite thing and standing up and speaking out or telling the truth or at least trying to engage in in rational. Uh, non-hateful discussion. But yeah, I mean, before we get into the details of, you know, what we're talking about, really, <laughs> <laughs> I I wonder if you can just tell me a little bit about your background. I mean, probably people outside of Canada, we have a pretty big, or I have a pretty big audience in the US, for example. We have people who watch in the UK and Australia. Um, people outside Canada, even people outside of BC, probably won't be familiar with your, your background and your history in, in leftist politics. So I wonder if you can... Um, I can give you a short sketch. I was sure. just asked to do that. So I'm already in practice from a podcast earlier today. Uh, okay, so um, I, uh, I come from a family of... Um, uh, pretty, uh, uh, my mother's side of the family descended from slaves. My father's side of the family descended from uh, working class migrants who fled to BC. Uh, both my maternal grandfather and my uh, paternal great grandfather ended up in BC because they've been blacklisted for everywhere else because of their socialism. So my uh, great granddad started soapboxing for the Bolsheviks uh, on the Clyde near Glasgow. My uh, my maternal grandfather started working to um, end the uh, the color bar in uh, for where railway porters and allow them to become uh, conductors. So uh, a lot of this, I was really fortunate to come out of legacies that while they were really traumatized and damaged by slavery and capitalism, uh, I came with an awareness into this life. One of the other things about that is that um, a consequence, I would say, to the damage to the family system and the damage to the epigenome and the damage to the people in it is that I've inherited from my parents uh, a way of addressing trauma, which is not always great, which is to seek public attention and validation. 
So politics and activism were a very logical route for me to go very early in life. I rose to prominence uh, because a group of people had burned out doing a campaign against McDonald's restaurants to raise awareness about ozone depletion and the way that we were being sold a bill of goods in the uh, late 80s, early 90s by DuPont Chemical to um, conceal ozone damaging materials. So I started out as a 16 year old kid who was organizing all these protests all over British Columbia against McDonald's restaurants to make them change their packaging to something that didn't hurt the ozone layer. And we won. So by the time I was 18, I was a minor national celebrity, went on to become the leader of the Green Party of British Columbia and turn it in a dramatically leftward direction. So in the 90s, under my leadership, we went from 0.86% to 11% in the polls. And by the end, we had made alliances with the NDP in Vancouver and Victoria. We're working on a provincial alliance. First Greens were elected under my leadership in Vancouver with 36% of the vote, in Victoria with 42% of the vote in 99. And then the Greens took a very rightward direction towards the center, um, away from holding office initially. And they've been a sort of 10 to 15% party ever since. I returned to the New Democratic Party, uh, which was not a hard thing to do. My granddad had represented the railway porters at the founding convention of the original Socialist Party, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation in 1931. So um, that was in my blood. I worked very hard to get the NDP elected, but I also continued to work to change the voting system. So I have been on the I've been a spokesman for the Yes Committee on more failed proportional representation referenda than anybody else, starting in 1996. So known as an electoral reform guy, known as a climate justice guy, um, longtime socialist. Uh, and now I'm, uh, for the past eight years, I've been building an institute called Los Altos Institute, which is a well, it's becoming more transnational every day COVID goes on. We're a small think tank that organizes reading groups and courses to uh, analyze empire, identity, and capitalism, uh, and how they're interacting in our present moment. And of course, it's that last part that lured me into all this trouble, which is the, the need to, uh, this realization I, played D and D with uh, a guy who ran, was the executive director of a right wing think tank in Toronto, the McKenzie Institute. And he talked to me about the robust intellectual culture of the Canadian right and how they created all these spaces to think aloud together. And that's why they were beating us. And so my focus more than electoral reform, more than the climate since uh, 2012 has been, has been that the creation of that space, and also the defense of the existence of some kind of left public square where we can think aloud together, because of course that's what's under attack and that's why we're here today. Mm -hmm. um, I know, so, uh, my understanding is that you were an NDP member for like 20 years yep. and, then, and you quit at some point. Yeah, well, I mean, I got to do that twice. So I was an NDP member from 1985 <laughs> until 1988 when I was a little kid. And then after I left the Greens, um, the New Democrats were very welcoming. I mean, not all the New Democrats. Uh, New Democrats hate apostates mostly, but um, there's some good folk. And Joy McPhail, who was the leader of the opposition, Ed Laval, who was the party's provincial secretary, welcomed me into the NDP. And there was this thinking that we weren't gonna repeat the mistakes that the NDP had made here in the 90s, where we really like beta tested Blairism before we even handed it off to Tony Blair. Uh, really, BC in 1991, you would struggle to find a version of Blairism that was earlier, where more stuff got tested. So people put a lot of energy in alluring me back into the NDP, saying we can make this a broadly socialist project. And I worked on that from 2001 to 2018 when the NDP decided to give $6 billion to big oil to build the largest uh, carbon bombs ever built in the history of British Columbia. 
and to take a pipeline full of fracked gas and run it through the traditional territory of the Wet'suwet'en people at gunpoint. It struck me especially that this was extra offensive because the company that they were doing all this for, the company that got a billion of the six billion dollars is Royal Dutch Shell the company that we previously associated with apartheid in the 1980s and 90s, with the murders of the Ogoni people in the Niger Delta. Uh, and just like in uh, South Africa and just like in Nigeria, um, Royal Dutch Shell has turned our provincial police force into their brute squad, who are they're now enforcers for... Uh, you know, the company we remember boycotting over apartheid 40 years ago. So I thought this is too much to take. This is just, uh, this is this is a bit fucking much. And the way I, I put it, because I uh, my PhD is from, is in history, but was also um, supervised by the Department of Religious Studies, I would say not as a praying man, but as a scholar of religion, uh, only a medieval theologian could label this ridiculous NDP Green Coalition running BC. They would label it as Lucifer's mockery of an eco-socialist government. Because uh, there, there's no way to fully express how this sort of pro-Uber, pro-fracking thing describes itself somehow as an environmentalist socialist project. So that was too much for me. I walked. I mean, and and beyond that, I wonder if you you have any any other criticisms of sort of the path that the NDP has taken since the 90s. I mean, my perspective, you've been more involved and more engaged by far than I have been. Um, but I know that, you know, a lot of people would criticize the NDP as having left socialism behind in some ways or sort of move towards the center more. I don't know if you agree with that or not. Oh, they, 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 they haven't moved towards the center. They've adopted the policies of conservatives in the 80s. That's what the left is today. That's what Joe Biden is. That's what uh, John Horgan is. Um, they're just 1980s conservatives. They're like selling the policies of Bill Van Der Zam and Brian Mulroney and George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan. Like that's, that's what these parties stand for. And it's been a global phenomenon um, where any social democratic party that was in power during the 90s turned into this because of massive structural forces that changed politics. You can go to Greece and hear about PASOK. You can go to Australia or Britain and hear about labor. You can go to India and hear about Congress. Like this is not a special thing that happened here. I mean, it was heartbreaking because it was a thing we experienced as individual actors and agents going through this incredible sellout. But I remember in 1989, uh, the BC NDP publicly renounced the redistribution of wealth as a doctrine. So let's be clear, 41, uh, sorry, 31 years ago, more than a generation ago, the leader of the New Democratic Party of British Columbia stood up in front of the Vancouver Board of Trade and said, the NDP no longer believes in the redistribution of wealth. And then four years later, um, he made a very important speech. It changed the direction of my life, changed the direction of the Green Party of BC at that time. Um, he said, you know, our number one priority now is to crack down on the welfare cheats and deadbeats and varmints who are coming into this province. Um, and that's what they did. There were 11,000 homeless people before that speech in BC. 18 months later, there were 27,000 homeless people. And the reason for that was they did things like prohibiting refugees both from working and from receiving social assistance. They did things like capping the number of people who were allowed to be disabled in the province concurrently at an arbitrary number, 12,000. They did that by cutting um, welfare payments to 
uh, by 10% in the middle of a massive recession. And so they really became the party of austerity uh, and uh, they've never looked back. What's fascinating is the work that people like us do to think this is some momentary aberration, to think that, oh, the party has lost its way. No, the party changed its direction, um, you know, a generation and a half ago. Our problem is we don't want to do the work of making something better. So we pretend that the NDP is something it's not. And right. it's an exercise in, in lazy self-deception. And I fall victim to it. I didn't want to go and do fringe politics again. I stuck with those people long after all the signs said the next time they get in, they're going to be even worse. But I was in denial because I didn't want the work. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you. And I find it frustrating that so many people still cling to the NDP and like that they sort of think, oh, maybe we can win them back. Like maybe we can convince them to return to what they once were, or what we wanted them to be or what we imagined or hoped that they, they could be um, what we're pretending that they are. You know, I think that it's kind of delusional. But it's part of, and one of the things that I, I really try and do in my scholarship is to show that these things that, you know, whether it's cancel culture, whatever we get into on the left, that really they're pale reflections of what's happening on the right. And that, that we're living with civilization wide changes in thought and politics. And we get way too focused in siloing developments and not seeing them as taking place across the spectrum. The Trump movement is another great example of the total aestheticization of politics, right? Mm -hmm. People have given up hope that the that who they elect will affect anything materially in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so instead, they engage in what I, I term Eucharistic voting, where what they really do is all they relate to is the symbolic meaning of their party. And because we're only in a debate about symbols in people's heads, we, we've lost the debate about the materiality of our physical environment or our wealth or, or our lives, because we've lost the, that as a thing to talk about, then it just becomes a competition among symbols. And so, with the, so a rising tide of Trumpism lifts all boats, right? What the Republican Party means to the people voting for it is completely disconnected from what the Republican Party does. They're subscribing to the symbolic order the Republican Party invokes. And that's exactly what's happening on our side of the spectrum too. We just like to point at the people on the other side and pretend we're different. Mm -hmm. so, so you founded the BC Eco-Socialist Party in 2019, is that correct? Well, I would not say I was the founder. I would say Jeff Berner what is the actual founder. He was the original registered leader and he brought in um, uh, he brought in his two old organizing pals from the 90s, Alana New Small and me to uh, to work on this thing. Uh, and um, you know, I think that triumvirate worked out about as well as uh, your average Central American junta or, uh, you know, Soviet uh, uh, government or, you know, late Republic Rome. But nevertheless, I do want to give credit where it's due. This was not my idea. This is a thing where in order to make the idea happen, there was nobody else who contained in their body so many of the skills and so much of the data that would be required. And you resigned from the BC Eco-Socialist Party very recently, um, last week. I wonder if you can talk about what happened there. Well, I think what happened there was that um, we tried to get the party ready for the onslaught that would come because you you can't like you you can't decry a half century old cross-partisan consensus in an industry captured petro state 
and not expect massive blowback, right? That there was going to be something that uh, would be used as the justification to deplatform us or whatever. Um, and I think that um, because the election was called so early, because we had a number of internal struggles in the organization, I realized very quickly that the board of the party was in no position to weather um, the the first real episode of um, of the blowback for daring to run in the election against the NDP and the Greens and offering people what they thought they were going to get when uh, the Greens and NDP signed their coalition agreement. I, I think that, um, I mean, I think transphobia is a convenient accusation because um, right now it has, it most closely socially replicates McCarthyism. So, right, one of the things people don't realize about McCarthyism is that it was mostly not the government doing it. It was mostly not Joe McCarthy. Most people whose careers were ended or whose lives were destroyed by McCarthyism in the 50s were people Congress and the Secret Service were completely unaware of, people the FBI never got around to persecuting. The dynamic in McCarthyism is that someone says, that guy's a communist. And if anyone stands up and says either A, communism might not be so bad, or B, I like that guy, I don't know anything about his politics, or C, that guy's not a communist. Those all mean the same thing, which are I too am a communist. So it has a, it has a real viral effect. The statement that statement isn't transphobic, that person isn't a transphobe, are understood by the broad majority of the population as, I want every single trans person in the world to be murdered immediately. So, uh, so it's pretty easy, like, uh, cause I insist on trying to have rational conversations with people for way too long. I got into a conversation with someone where I said, you know, the these women who you're persecuting, they, I remember them from the 90s, like they were the allies of trans people. They're feminists. They agree with you about 90% of what you're saying. Why don't you consider talking to them instead of campaigning to get them blacklisted? But of course, um, those words, and I don't believe these, the, the people I was dealing with are insincere. I honestly believe that the trans activists who read what I had said believed that they'd received a death threat uh, because the whole culture of identitarianism inculcates that belief that identity equals ontology, that um, who you are is the same as existence itself. And so if people live in a world, and especially if they, they, they build a, a whole life narrative on that culture, um, these beliefs that um, you or I are threatening to murder them are absolutely sincere. It's one of the reasons our society gives a free pass to um, rape and murder threats that are issued in response. Yeah, and so, I mean, what what went down in part, as in as much as I have observed on social media, was that, I mean, this is, you know, an oversimplification possibly, but you were defending two women who were essentially accused of defending what J.K. JK Rowling, Rowling said. Yes. So here's what I, and it's interesting. No one, even people on my side can parse what I did. What I said was these two women are good people and they're your allies. Please don't hurt them. They have put up, they have stated they support JK Rowling a because they believe that rape threats are an illegitimate form of political speech and B because they agree with these three things that JK Rowling has said. 
Now, at no point did I even state I concurred with those views. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps had I been in a different social or political context, I might have said I conferred, concurred with them. But the point is I never did. What I said was, these people aren't bad or these people aren't guilty. And in this way, right, this is McCarthyism. These people aren't communists. Therefore, what I'm really saying is I'm a communist. Right. And it, it's, yeah, and it's not just that these people aren't bad, but, you know, perhaps these are reasonable concerns that should be addressed as such rather than treated as proof of some heresy or crime. Yeah, and I think heresy is a good term. Um, I think that we're, uh, I think that we're, uh, we owe Rowling a debt for, um, leaning hard on, um, the terminology around the witch persecutions when, uh, there was that initial fight. Um, because I think that whether we agree fully with her analysis, um, it's helpful. We have to remember we're analyzing two things. We're not simply... We're, we're analyzing primarily not uh, the lives of people who are changing their gender or adjacent to people who are trying to change their gender. What we're analyzing is how discourses about this affect social movements miles away from those events. Mm -hmm. And that that's a big concern for me. I It's one of the reasons that... Um, it's it's like things don't actually have to be proximate at all to the debate. They distort social movements now so far away from it. And I'm sure that if someone stands up and says, Stuart Parker's a good guy, Stuart Parker's a good guy will now mean to a certain portion of the trans community, I want to kill you. Right. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I I've often wondered why... Trans activism, I mean, however you want to frame it, like I sometimes call it trans activism or gender identity ideology, um, you know, statements that are to be accepted no matter what. And if you question them or you don't accept them wholly, um, you're blacklisted, ostracized, maybe threatened with death, rape, what have you. You know, statements like trans women are literally women um, or, you know, ideas like you can literally change your sex and that, you know, males who identify as transgender or who transition to trans women should be allowed full access to all women's spaces, no questions asked. I mean, why do you think that this has become such a major issue and debate particularly on the left. I mean, to me, like my primary like concern around gender identity ideology, around gender identity legislation has always been the impact on women and women's rights and women's spaces. And so to me, it's, it's a particularly egregious thing that the left has taken this up because I feel that women have been completely thrown under the bus. You know, the left has refused to listen to our concerns, criticisms, questions, and, you know, vilified us all. And I don't, totally understand why. Yeah, and I, I think that there, there are a few pieces of this because it's not, in my view, primarily on the left. I spent two years living in America during the Tea Party wave, and I think it does give me a bit of a different optic. I think it's that we don't recognize right identitarianism, that we're so focused on the siloed battle here. But one of the things that the Donald Trump presidency re uh, represents is um, this um, is a new kind of patriarchy. Uh, it's a it's a different face of patriarchy, and one of the interesting things about it is that it is about the unmediated access to and control of women's bodies, including the bodies of one's female children, right? If we imagine that there are no gaffes, that all the gaffes are intentional, we see a very different narrative for the rise of Trump. 
What we see is a man who accepts the Republican nomination for president by French kissing his daughter on a stage and grabbing her ass in front of 17 million live viewers. Um, and that's because in evangelical America, um, there has been a longer term shift towards these large porous cells where there's a social movement of people. We see it with incels, but we also see it with these successful patriarchs like Trump, whose power is demonstrated by their unmediated and unqualified access to women's bodies, that women's bodies are in fact part of their rights, that they were not looking at a theory of individual rights, the base unit of society is the male patriarchal unit. The old man is the head of that unit. He commands that unit. And among his rights are the rights to control the bodies of his women and his children. And then we see building around that, there's this incel ideology, which modern trans activists heavily poach from, right? Where a woman sleeping with a man is not understood as a decision by the woman at all. It's that there is supposed to be a rationing protocol where every adult man is issued a female body he has sexual access to. And the rationing protocol has gone wrong because I haven't been issued one and I have a right to one. Mm -hmm. And so the, there has been a reconceptualization of the nature of self that we've moved to a more traditional theory of the base unit in society. And this did not creep into the left through trans activism. I remember working in Toronto with trans activists who were my friends, they were my allies, um, and they were saying some of the smartest, sharpest, most feminist things 10 years ago. You know, what an amazing length of time a decade is where the spokespeople for trans women were uh, feminists. Uh, in any way, I'll tell you what the controversy was in Toronto in 2010. It was the school mosque debate. So the idea was that um, um, conservative Muslim families were pulling their kids out of school too much to go to church because we could only use statutory holidays to accommodate Christians and professional development days to accommodate Jews. And there were no holidays left for Muslim kids. Kids are being pulled out of school. So what, what, what the Toronto District School Board does is go, well, we'll just put mosques in the schools and we'll pick the, the, uh, the, the clergymen who are most popular. So they pick very conservative imams. And the first rule they made in the school mosques was that um, menstruating girls weren't allowed in because they were unclean in the sight of God. And so it became the doctrine of the Toronto School Board, the liberal Toronto School Board, that menstruating girls were unclean in the sight of God. And I realized that school board was conceptualizing rights in terms of not individual people, but the patriarchal family unit. Where do we trace that to regionally? We trace it to George Galloway. This is Gallowayism. The only way Muslim men will be free is if they can control their women and children the way Christian men like me can. And so I think there's been a slow burn of this coming in on the left. I think that trans activism is its primary site on the left today, but I think that its primary site in the world today is inside the Trump movement, inside the Modi movement, right? If you wanna hear a discourse of the ownership of access to women's bodies, right? Modiites are gonna be among the best. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, so when you're talking about the sort of incel ideology as applied to trans activism, are you talking about this idea that, you know, lesbians are somehow hateful and bigoted because they don't want to partner with or have sexual relationships or date trans women who were told over and over and over again are literal women. And therefore, you know, why would a lesbian refuse a trans woman? Why, you know, this, this trans woman is entitled to date women as a lesbian. She, and what's interesting is that uh, she is entitled for women to be attracted to her, which is of course an entitlement a woman would not conceptualize normally, mm -hmm. right? So it's, I mean, we see this comes right out of incel culture. I have a right 
to be attractive to someone else. But that actually isn't what's going on. The only way you can think that is to nullify the personhood entirely of the woman, right? That her thoughts about me are not a part of a separate autonomous entity. Her thoughts about me are a set of rights I have possessed my whole life that I was born into the world with. I have the right to be thought of by women in this particular way, not just the right to be thought of as a woman or a man in the case of incels, but the right to be thought of as attractive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, you could like, I would argue that, you know, a lot of men on the left have a conception of, you know, their right to women's bodies and it sort of just manifests itself in a different way. And I'm, you know, like I'm thinking specifically of the fight to legalize prostitution, which has been taken up by, by many on the left, wherein, you know, prostitution should be legalized and, you know, and sort of like an, an acceptance of a pornography is something that should exist and that it is normal and okay for men to use. I mean, those are, those are ideas that liberals and the left, you know, progressives have, have, have pushed. Yeah. It's interesting, right? Cause I mean, we do know that, uh, um, I mean, I, you know, the legal formula for how to deal with, uh, with the sex trade is incredibly complex because, you don't want to drive it further underground because that endangers. That's also another kind of danger. And so, but the problem is that the discourse, that our discourse when we talk about the sex trade is that we refuse to recognize it's intrinsically damaging, mm -hmm. right? That, um, that we're trying to regulate an evil rather than trying to regulate a commodity. And I think the, and it's, it's like, and we have to be, and we have to be clear, right? The commodity sex, right, is being divorced from the body that produces it. That we're saying, oh no, we're regulating a commodity. We're not managing the labor of persons. Yeah, yeah, totally. I and I mean, I don't, I don't want to get too far off topic. So, like, I wanted to come back to. I read, I read um, a number of your. Um, blog posts, your essays that you've published on your websites, um, particularly the essays around identitarianism. And in one of those essays, you, you address the issue of transgenderism. So you talk about this, this thing that's happened over the past few years where lesbians are being kicked out of pride. They're even being kicked out of the dyke march. Um, they're being labeled as bigots. They're being labeled as hateful because they don't want to sleep with males who identify as transgender or trans women, whatever it is. Um, and and I think you also point out the fact that it is kind of, I mean, correct me if I'm I'm wrong, but that it's, uh, you know, kind of absurd to expect that trans women literally be treated as women, you know, exactly the same as if they, they were female. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to know how people responded to that essay. Well, people don't respond, right? Because what we have to understand is identitarianism is not an ideology, it's an orthodoxy. And so um, we often, in um, our analytical frame, we have this desire to assume that the other side is making sense to itself the way we are making sense to ourselves. And we assume that uh, this movement is made out of ideas that are consistent or stable or fit together with one another. And uh, uh, there's no evidence for that. What there is, uh, the identitarian movement is a system of etiquette. It's a system of determining who is allowed to say what and whether what someone has said is permissible. Right. So when Galileo goes before the Catholic Church, they don't rule that the planets are in crystalline spheres and Galileo is wrong that they're not. They don't rule that the planets go in circles, not ellipses, and Galileo is wrong. The ruling is that Galileo never had permission to say those things. And because he never had permission to say those things, they are now unsaid and they don't, their facticity does not have to be disputed at all. So the purpose of identitarianism is to create opportunities for people 
to obtain honor, like in the 17th century, where a, a black man speaks to a white woman and, and you take off your gloves and you get out your musket and you dispatch him on the street because so the, this kind of discourse across social ranks is inappropriate. And then you've defended the white woman and, and the glory redounds to you. And that is what identitarianism is on social media and in our communities. It is the ability to take offense on behalf of others because an impermissible thing has been said about them. And one of the things that makes a system of etiquette powerful is it's faddish, it's complex, and it's constantly changing. And so there is always the chance that the thing you say will be outside the system of etiquette unless you slavishly follow its development. So I want to, so I'm really, um, so what's going on with identitarianism is about people taking opportunities to take offense and then engage in these sort of McCarthyite practices. Um, an identitarian came to defend me on my page because, you know, I still am friends with identitarians. I, I have a social life. And his number one defense of me was the reason you're, Stuart Parker's being persecuted is that people don't know he's black. Um, if you knew that he was a racialized person, then you would understand that he was entitled to say more of the things he said than you thought he was. And I think that is so descriptive of the discourse. It's entirely about what my identity group allowed me to say in a particular context to a particular audience. So on this question of, um, you know, uh, uh, trans people, you know, I, I'm right off on, on the polar end of the, of the spectrum in some ways from gender critical feminists. Because my argument is I'm a historian and I look for trans people in every society I study historically. And I find them because of course, gender binaries are absurd. The gender as a for, as a social is oppressive. Um, I'm a gender abolitionist. And so of course there are gonna be some people in a society who instead of like wearing the misfitting coat called masculinity or femininity, have to tear off the coat and be nonconformist because it's unendurable that their gender is such an ill-fitting coat. Because um, no, gender doesn't fit anybody like a well-tailored suit, right? There are only two sizes, only two designs. Fabric is terrible. So my thing is, well, how do we in the long term, because God knows what the backlash is going to be from this moment on trans people. It's going to be horrific. Like, the, the, this is going to stop. And like, the incels will be in charge and horrific violence will be perpetrated. And so my questions are, what are the things that trans people actually need in order to survive and be okay? Um, do they need this identitarian discourse? Um, and I, I, I think back to my conversations with Nina Arsenault in Toronto, with Jamie Lee Hamilton in Vancouver, right? And they're basic material things like, um, you know, if my, I need my particular kind of body to be treated by a doctor who can handle dealing with this non-ordinary body. Mm. Um, but the problem is that when you say, um, when you have this idea, when Jessica Yaniv says, I demand a gynecologist look at my penis, um, that's a moment where it's like, actually, everyone's in danger now, including you. That pretending these, like, um, for people who've transitioned, Right? They're on a medicated regime the rest of their lives that other people aren't on, and they now need that medicine. So the idea that they should be treated identically is insane. Mm -hmm. If people, like we all have to be treated based on our needs. But the, one of the reasons this is possible is what the term, what the statement trans women are women actually is. It's a talking point. 
talking points were invented by the PR industry at the beginning of neoliberalism when deregulation started increasing the number of product recalls and factory disasters. And so they created these things that um, superficially appear to be an effort to communicate, but they're catchphrases that corporate representatives are supposed to repeat in order to beat all meaning out of a conversation to just keep saying these words again and again until the audience disengages because they can't make sense of the conversation because there's no sense to be made. Uh, trans women are women is exactly that. It's the ultimate talking point. It doesn't mean anything in particular. Um, but it's a thing that if you don't repeat it, um, well, then, uh, then we're in a McCarthyite situation. But in fact, it pushes us away from the discourse about the needs of anyone, the needs of uh, people, you know, the needs of regular women who want to have spaces in which they both are and feel safe. Uh, really basic stuff like that. It pushes all those conversations away, but it also pushes away those conversations about the needs of trans people. Um, instead, the demand is that uh, we, we treat people as though they reside in a fool's paradise. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. Like, I feel like these mantras don't help anyone. They don't help people who identify as transgender. You know, I don't think that it's helpful or productive or safe to tell people who identify as transgender that they're literally the opposite sex because it's not true. And obviously there are going to be health implications for, for insisting such things. Um, it's also just, you know, it's not purposeful in general because I don't think that it's true that if we accept trans women as literal women that will protect them or offer them more respect or dignity or keep them safe from discrimination than if we were just to understand them as you know, this sex and a desire to transition to this sex or a desire to, you know, operate within a different gender identity to express themselves in sort of like a gender non-conforming way, whatever it is. Um, and, and I think you're right. Like, and I actually thought that was really a good and interesting analysis um, around this kind of corporate crisis communication thing. And, you know, we see this with regard to a number of different issues. And of course, we see this within trans activism, where it's like, you repeat these specific mantras over and over and over again. And if you don't repeat those mantras, or you question those mantras, or you try to engage in conversation around these mantras, you challenge them in any way, you're instantly labeled a bigot, or, you know, people disengage, or they just start repeating new mantras at you, or they label you, you know, a turf, a bigot, hateful, violent, dangerous, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I, where do you think, like, why did, why would people on the left take on these strategies? Like, do you even think they realize they're doing it? Uh, no. And I, I'm with Chris Hedges, like uh, Chris Hedges is way ahead of me for years. And I really dismissed a lot of things he said, as I did you. Um, and, uh, you know, I've caught up and the idea that the billionaire class that runs our social media is interested in the left having coherent conversations with itself is pretty nutty. Yeah. I think that Hedges is right. That the right has so dominated its own discourse, has so thought that through, that um, uh, there are PR boiler rooms that we don't know about that are figuring out the next stupid hashtag to get lefties on. Um, I think that there are not just internal forces within our movements, I think there are external forces that are trying to destroy our ability to think. Uh, I think that it's, um, it's, it's really, it's where my activism now points. It used to point at electoral politics, about, oh, fix the voting system, oh, get Greens elected. Now it's like, no, we're, this is ground zero. Can we think together at all? 
can we create some kind of left or socialist public square in which um, in which we're not being manipulated into stupidity and irrationality. And uh, I, I really think the people we're up against are well enough resourced, powerful enough. Why wouldn't Mark Zuckerberg be doing this? Why, why wouldn't the folks who made Twitter and Tumblr, Tumblr a big incubator of all this, why wouldn't they be doing this? Uh, and so I think we're being manipulated, but I think we're also at a moment where we stayed in an alliance with progressives for too long and we don't know how to survive without them. We went into these popular front alliances in the 30s because Stalin thought they were a good idea. And here we are 90 years later trying to weld progressivism, the politics of Teddy Roosevelt, um, you know, onto some kind of socialistic thought. So, I mean, and I think it's opportunistic. I think it's that identitarianism rise coincided with um, or functioned synergistically with a rise on the recognition of transgender people. One of the interesting features to remember here is, uh, and there's a great irony with the JK Rowling book burnings, because we associate book burning with the Nazis. And the Nazis were actually not that big book burners. Their one big book burning, which is the one you always see photos of, was them burning all of the books in German about transgender people. Uh, so one of the things that happens when you have the kind of wealth disparity that we do and the installment plan culture that we do, and we're in a kind of late, late capitalist order like we were a hundred years ago, people start problematizing their gender identities on a pretty large scale. We've already been through this once before. There was a huge increase in the number of trans people in the teens and 20s when the same material conditions were happening in our order. And so as that natural consequence of this, of this acceleration of the economic order happened, there was now this whole complex of communications tech that could turn it into something more. And of course, could turn it into something more in alliance with the pharmaceutical industry. It's amazing those investor reports that you read about how the number of people per capita afflicted with rapid on onset gender dysphoria, dysphoria is expected to increase by 4.1% per year for the next 20 years. Uh, and how this is great news and we're gonna get a dividend. Now, I also just want to go back to one other thing that we missed, which is there are lots of ways for there to be a place for trans people in a society without this allegation of being identical. And we have the example of the bathroom debate in Thailand, um, which preceded our bathroom debate by 10 years, right? Right. 10 years before we were trying to create these gender neutral bathrooms everyone went to, Thailand at the, at the behest of um, uh, trans women college students began creating special trans people bathrooms because the main concern of these college students was they wanted their own bathroom so that they would be safe from female disapproval and male violence and especially male violence. Uh, and so uh, we see universities all over Thailand. And it's not just in the sex trade areas, it's at universities primarily, where we have the totally opposite solution to the trans bathroom debate. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a community of people who fought to get their own bathrooms and are glad to have got them and feel that they are safer there than um, I think anybody feels in a modern gender neutral bathroom. I don't feel good in a modern gender neutral bathroom. I, I feel extra gross, but it's like I have the least consequences because I, I have the body that the, the culture really likes. Yeah, I mean, to that, this has always seemed like the obvious solution to me is third spaces. 
Um, and I don't know why that's not uh, a more central part of the, the debate that we're having right now, as though there can only be one or the other, and there's no possible alternative solution. There's no middle ground, nothing. Um, I guess I, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about the the social media factor, because I think that social media really has shaped this particular conversation um, and the way that these debates happened. I mean, we know that social media has like a major impact on our politics. Um, and, you know, we talk a lot about social media bubbles and, and echo chambers, for example. So you get sort of stuck in this alg algorithm. You end up kind of seeing the same opinions over and over again. You stop being exposed to alternate opinions. Um, and I've sort of wondered if, you know, this this dominant ideology around, or seemingly dominant ideology, I don't actually think it is the dominant ideology, but seemingly dominant ideology around gender identity where trans women are literally women, and if you refer to a male as he instead of she, and he prefers to be referred to as she, then that's violence, and anybody who talks about the potential impact of gender identity legislation on women is um, bigoted and terrible, um, or, you know, if, if we express concerns about the, the young girls and, you know, particularly lesbians who are being transitioned because of this rapid onset, um, dysphoria trend that we're seeing, like, I, I, I sort of wonder if it, part of the reason it became so accepted and repeated and repeated in, in, in really often, you know, kind of vitriolic, in sometimes violent ways was because people started seeing this repeated over and over and over again on social media. And because these corporations, these social media corporations embraced these, these mantras and these hashtags and these sayings and determined that actually you can't have these conversations and you can't question these mantras. And then it's like, Oh, okay, this is the wrong thing. This is the right thing here we go, which is sort of odd for, you know, leftists or progressives to go along with without, you know, being like, oh, I, does Twitter have our best interests? Does Twitter have the best interests of marginalized people in mind? You know, like, why would they be invested in this issue particularly? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I think that that's the problem is that uh, if you aestheticize your politics, um, then, right, progressive is to be hep, to be urban, um, it's to, uh, to, uh, to, to strike a certain pose, to stand behind something that is concurrently unpopular and hegemonic. And that's similar, it's the same thing with climate science, which of course I believe in climate science. I've spent years explaining it to people, but climate science now works the same way where you can't say anything about carbon atoms you, there's no discourse. There's just 99% of scientists agree. 99% of, why don't you agree with 99% of scientists? Mm. So it's actually, I think the climate issue and the reframing of the climate issue for the left by people like the Koch brothers to take us from an appeal to reason to an appeal to authority. I really see that as having been the gateway to all kinds of other appeals to authority that have now become normative left discourse because the side we were from, I guess, is now the side of the appeal to authority, right? The mantra of the right is do your research. Now they do their research really badly, but anti-vaxxers have the faith that you can look shit up and figure things out. And our response to the anti-vaxxers is no, no regular person could figure shit out or look things up. Mm. No, we must listen to, so there's a wholesale cultural change. Gender is just one element of it. The, the, long before the left embraced any kind of political authoritarianism, it developed a predilection for intellectual authoritarianism to the, the triumph of the appeal to authority over all other rhetorical appeals. So I think that that's part of it. Um, I think that there's a tremendous desire um, for people to feel that there are people that they can um, liberate or save who are, uh, one of the things, the, the most poisonous myths of the left 
is what you re what you see when we talk about the residential schools where we go our forebearers were evil black hatted villains who wanted to hurt everyone and we are totally different people who like people and don't want to hurt them and what that means is that we can't see that we've been through this with eugenics we've been through this with the residential schools that these projects were not animated by a stated desire to commit murder they were animated by um a patronizing discourse of we must help these indigenous people by educating them in this way we must help these minority communities by sterilizing their mental defectives and chlorinating their water that um, there's and there's this sense right that of course there wasn't some time a century ago where there were lots of transgender people and we already had this debate everything is novel and i think that um because the science around gender change is novel um it's much easier to to see this as the new moment of liberation that it was gay liberation before and before that it was the end of segregation and before you know and this is this is the new group of people that uh white liberals are going to save and there is all kinds of technological and social novelty around it and i think that's why it makes it extra easy to believe that this is not the new elect group but the new group to prove that we are the elect mm -hmm. by bending over backwards to um uh in these i would say um, materially problematic ways mm -hmm. yeah and i mean i think i mean part of what frustrates me about so i guess modern leftist discourse and you know, I, I notice it particularly coming from the younger generations is that, you know, we sort of position, position, you know, bad things happen because people are bad and they wanted bad things to happen. Um, people on the other side of politi the political spectrum are evil and want bad things happen. You know, people who are conservative, people who are right wing, um, it's either that they're stupid or bad. Like there's no understanding of why people think the way that they think, why they might support certain policies or ideas, why they believe the things that they believe. And it's totally unproductive. And I mean, obviously this happens in the trans debate, but this happens around all sorts of other issues, race, immigration, climate change, anti-vaccination, abortion, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, oh, okay, I guess like we can just, I mean, how is it productive if we've just decided that everybody we disagree with on various issues or every time a bad thing happened, that happened because this person was like a bad, evil person who wanted to murder a bunch of people or like wanted people to suffer. That's not usually how things go. Yeah, no, the anti-vax movement are the folks who are giving out the hugs right now. Uh, yes, they're killing kids, but they're giving out the hugs and some people really need a hug. Uh, there are lots of, you know, moments like that. And I think that binary affects um, us in a lot of ways. You know, so I, I've i recently come to subscribe to more sort of Facebook feeds by gender critical feminists. And one of the things that I see that concerns me is that when you're thrown out of the orthodoxy into the hellscape, right, and you've been canceled, we look around for allies. And I see, you know, there's a surprising amount of stuff in my feed now from conservative evangelical organizations. Um, and it's very like what happened in the porn split in the 80s, right? Feminist movement, you know, there's the anti-porn feminists and the pro-porn feminists. The pro-porn feminists, surprise, surprise, win, because porn men are on their side. And um, what happens? A lot of anti-porn feminists end up working with the religious right, with conservative evangelicals, because if por opposing porn is your number one issue, then those are your allies. Those are the people who are working on your file. And so because 
the discourse is so binary, more so than it was 40 years ago during the, the porn split, which we're really just recapitulating with the TRA split. Um, and we see that because of the swerf thing. That's just a repeat of the porn split. Um, what happens is we're so starved for allies that we throw in not just in good ways, but sometimes in problematic ways with conservative evangelicals. And this is one of the reasons that I'm, you know, I, I find this an extra delicate thing. My role in the voting reform movement after the, be, the voting reform movement was started by uh, in BC by an alliance between Greens, Neo Jeffersonians, and the taxpayer movement, and the Christian right. Uh, and we built real issue based coalitions. We knew we agreed on exactly one thing, we kn and we knew how to partner on a single issue basis respect each other, work against each other on everything else. And, you know, I still have friends from that time. Uh, the voting reform movement chose to reject that after 2005, and its fortunes have collapsed as a result because they viewed my saying, well, why aren't we working with the CTF? Why aren't we working uh, with the Christian Heritage Party these these are the people who gave us our volunteers. This is how we're going to win. Um, you know, uh, this is how we're going to win the Nachaco Lakes riding. Um, people were just incredulous. It's like, well, those people are the bad guys. So on the one hand, I'm probably more comfortable than most people on the left with working with the Christian right. But I'm also practiced at it. I know which thing I, I'm a little more critical. But there are fake journals out there that are being run by the Christian right that um, tell us stuff that's too good to be true in pronouncing conclusively on the gender ideology. Sometimes our email lists and our Twitter feeds republish junk science from the Christian right. And when people call us on it, we often go, we, it pushes us further onto the Christian right side. And I actually think that's the big picture. We know from polls that three quarters of the population agrees with J.K. Rowling. And all the right needs to do is make uh, whether women have penises the wedge issue in an election, and they will reap massive rewards. Uh, they will reap massive rewards. If that becomes the defining issue when people go to the polls, um, all kinds of people will side with the Christian right. And those, and that's really, I think, a lot of what's going on here, that our side is being made stupid and hostile to us um, so that we'll go and work with um, really problematic people. Well, yeah, and I mean, I, I think it's true that there are women who are so angry with the left and feel so abandoned and attacked by the left and have had, and literally have been blacklisted and ostracized by the left to the point where they're like, well, you know, if the conservative government is going to take on this issue of Bill C-16, if they're going to repeal Bill C-16, if they're going to be the ones who are going to listen to me and pay attention to my concerns and, you know, treat my concerns with respect, then maybe I will have to consider voting for the conservative party. I mean, there's lots of women who felt kind of abandoned by the NDP for some time now, and then maybe this issue kind of pushed them over the ledge. And I don't know what, you know, it, it makes sense in a lot of ways. And it doesn't have to be even the conservative party glomming onto this issue because so much of it is like a reaction to the left, not like, oh, well, the right are our saviors, but like, you know, like, fuck these assholes. <laughs> like, where yeah. else do I go? Yeah, and I think that's right. I mean, I don't think anybody's making irrational decisions as individual decision makers. The point is we've set up an irrational discourse that has two unacceptable paths for us. Uh, and they're both misogynistic paths, right? The, uh, the idea that our choice is between the pro-rape left and the anti-abortion movement, uh, that's, that's a false choice. Like, that's a hideous choice. 
but that I think, I think that that is the macro goal uh, of the right in shaping this whole discourse through social media and through the conventional media is um, to place that false choice before us. Uh, because it, it's a, either, either choice is a capitulation. And so we've got to, we have to break out of that choice. I'm not saying we can never work with the Christian right on an issue where we have something in common. Mm -hmm. I am the poster child for how you can do that. And it's funny, nobody's brought up my past in that way as a discrediting thing, but, but there we go. But I do think we've got to be more circumspect and, we just have to keep hammering away at hollowing out, and we're doing it on this program. You've been really leading the charge there to hollowing out a piece of the public square that is colonized by neither misogynist influence. Mm -hmm. um, I I wanted to ask you. I should have asked you this earlier, but you. So you talk about identitarianism. Whereas I think a lot of people talk about identity politics, and I wonder why you specifically chose the term identitarianism and how you differentiate. Like for you, is that a separate thing than identity? identity there are politics? lots of kinds of identity politics. There have been many kinds of identity politics at many times. I started out using the term identity politics when Bernie Sanders was using it to refer to the thing I now label identitarianism. But I realized that what identitarianism, we always have a politics of identity. There's always identity politics. And identitarianism is a rupture in many ways with previous politics of identity, with previous identity politics, because it is an honor-based offense etiquette system. Uh, it's not even an ideology. It might defend ideologies it might be oversubscribed to by people of particular ideologies. But this the fundamental tenet of identitarianism is who people think I am is something I own. It's a part of me. In every previous system of etiquette and honor, the pronoun politics was the second person pronoun. It was about how you were addressed right? Did you have the right title? Are you tu or uste? Are you tu or vu? Are you you or thou? Um, is the queen we or I? These are the kinds of questions. Identitarianism regulates the third person pronoun. It regulates who people say you are when you're not there. Mm. And that's a really, it's, it's unprecedented not just socially, but grammatically. It's an unprecedented new grammar of identity. And what it does is it conceptualizes people's opinions about you as part of your private property. That who someone says you are when you're not there is not theirs to know or say. It is only yours to know or say, right? The incel battle cry on Facebook is always, you don't know me. And what they mean is the, the version of me that you're seeing is not the version of me in my mind's eye. And who I am is who I am in my mind's eye, not who you experience me as being. And as a survivor of uh, sexual abuse, I know what that discourse is, right? That is the discourse of the respectable rapist, mm -hmm. right? That's... Um, that is totally how a powerful rapist like Donald Trump functions by using the courts, by using his children as propagandists, by using the law to control what other people's, who other people say he is when he's not there. And in my view, I, one of my weirder blog posts is about the Doctor Who episode, Castro Valva, which is entirely about this, that the constitutive statement on which any anti-oppressor, when you challenge an oppressor, the first thing you have to be able to say is you are not who you say you are. And what identitarianism does is it deprives us of the ability to say that. And I, I don't know anybody who is like, 
been able to go on as a functioning person after uh, experiencing sexual violence who didn't have to go through that step to be able to not physically, but to conceptually look at the image of their rapist in the, in the mind's eye of the rapist and go, you are not who you say you are. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you, I mean, I think a, a lot of leftist women who are also, you know, gender critical, if you want to call them that, you know, women who are critical of gender identity ideology, who are interested in protecting women's rights in spaces, um, and, you know, and came from the left, they'll, they'll sort of say, okay, these people, so if you say, you know, like, if you're criticizing the left for having taken up trans activism, for having ostracized and vilified women who challenge trans, uh, trans activism, etc., a lot of people will say, you know, okay, well, these aren't real leftists. This is the fake left. Like, this is not a real leftist analysis. This is a, like, neoliberal analysis, or this is an individualistic analysis, blah, 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 blah. Like, I, I don't, I mean, I wonder if you think there's any value in sort of differentiating between, like, real left and fake left when it's like, well, these people call themselves leftists, and this is what you know, most people understand to be the left. This is who's representing the left. So maybe may, this and it's is an the identitarian left. moment because they identify as left. Identify right. as left is one of my favorite phrases these days. It's like, well, I guess we're going to need another term then <laughs> for who I am. Um, Cause yeah. there are a lot of uh, people who identify as left and it means about the same as when we identify as anything else that if it's not backed up by some sort of action, it's just a thing people say. Um, and of course, the other side says the same about us, right? They, the other side argues there's not one single feminist who opposes trans activism because if you oppose trans activism, um, you know, ergo, you're not a real you feminist. A feminist. <laughs> and so you get these totally tautological identity arguments um, that, that, yeah, they do take us absolutely nowhere. Um, I think we've, um, so I, I don't know how to, how to move past, um, that, that question of labels, but, um, uh, the other term I have started using is this is, this is the bizarro left. Like it's actually, it's totally the DC comics bizarro world, especially because, uh, in bizarro, bizarro Superman begins nearly every sentence with the word me. Uh, so, uh, so maybe we're in the bizarro left. I don't know. Um, I mean, yeah. So my, I mean, my last question is of course the big one that maybe there's no answer to, but it's, you know, how do we get through this? Like, how do we get past these like shouting mantras around and to the point where we can't have real conversations where people are not, you know, representing one another's argu arguments fairly. One side is vilified. This side is good. This side is bad. Um, and you know, like these, these people who ask these questions need to resign from their leftist parties. Um, they need to be blacklisted, ostracized, you know, canceled, essentially this like cancel culture thing that, that so many on the left are participating in. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, uh, I think we have to think our way out. And the only way we can do that is by slowly, incremental, building, rebuilding the space inside which we can think. Um, so we've just got to keep pushing outwards. One of the things that I think is very helpful to learn from the Bolsheviks, they got a lot wrong, but Lenin got into power and he went, well, we have to dismantle this much of capitalism just so we can start thinking about what socialism would look like. We have to... We have to, like, there's, the imagination is far more curtailed by our material conditions, far more curtailed by our discursive conditions. And so we just have to do the heavy lifting of making this little space you and I are in a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and building the organizational infrastructure necessary to make a genuine left public sphere happen. And we can have that public square. We just have to, you know, build it as fast as we can without, you know, taking really problematic shortcuts. Uh, so I think that's part of it. But I also think this moment is at an end really soon. Um, the, the individuals who are transitioning, um, 
right? There, no, it's nobody's agenda really to defend um, those individuals. Uh, there, the way that the trans leadership has been replaced, that people like Arsenault and Hamilton have been replaced by people like OJ. Um, that's because we're moving towards a crescendo here. Um, we're getting ready for the right to make this gender ideology their issue and to um, weaponize it and to mobilize violence against um, the whole left, especially those who swallowed the ideology and especially those who've been medicalized by that ideology. And I think those will be the first, just as they were with um, in the 20s and 30s, it's those people who will be the first targets of the urban right militias, the first targets of, ma of, uh, of mass roundups and things like this. Like this moment won't go on indefinitely because it's moving towards a darker thing. They're just getting their ducks in a row here. They're gonna make some profits through pharma for the next five to 10 years. And then the complex that has been elevating and amplifying the worst aspects of the trans community will turn on that community um, and, uh, and will be hugely popular for doing so. Uh, it will be hugely popular and we have to we have to remember that for better or worse this moment won't last forever and we have to hope that the moment isn't going in the direction that i see it as going because there's a lot of good folks who have been caught up in all this and a lot of good folks who have had their autism treated with this unsuccessfully or something else who are going to be really vulnerable when this ephemeral social consensus disappears. Yeah, it's true, sadly. Um, Aligo, thank you so much for your time. It was really awesome. It was super interesting to talk with you and I really appreciate you having this conversation with me. Um, yeah.